Ken Lehman is going to introduce our keynote speaker for today, and I'll work on the computer. I'm glad I'm married to one of those number crunchers, too. So, uh, you know, I think they've all reiterated something over and over again, is, is to walk before you run. And uh, we're going to we're going to have quite a bit of experiments in, in our operation this year. We have several thousand acres that was prevent plant, and it's all under a cover of some sort. So, <coughs> you know, we're, we're going to get trial by fire next spring, perhaps. Our speaker today is someone that, if you've paid attention over the past several years in any of the farm magazines, there's been a little three or four page tan colored insert in there that Howard Buffett's foundation has sponsored. And a lot of the material in there was about the Anson family in south southwestern Indiana. And so that's how I happened upon suggesting Mark for our speaker here today. And I met him last winter at the Dunetail Conference in Indiana. So I, I won't tell you a whole lot more about it other than uh, that they've had a lot of experience on a lot of acres. And uh, he's going to fill you in on that. So Mark, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, it's truly an honor and pleasure to be here today to talk about healthy soils. It's something that changed my life in a core value way. And it occurred for me August 5th of 2010, attending an event very similar to this. I went to that event farming with three brothers and my dad at that time and we was farming in nine counties in two states. I was pretty frustrated. It's stressful farming for family. It's stressful farming period after years like this. Um, so when I got there, it was a new awakening for me. Everything that they were talking about was what I had learned when I was a child helping on the farm, how the farm soil smell good, how we did see the amount of erosion, and how we wasn't over tilling the ground. So come on the way down there, I felt like at that particular time in the early 2000s, we was only in where we farm in Knox County, southwestern Indiana, <coughs> is where the Wabash River and the White River come together about 50 miles from Evansville where it meets the Ohio. Our soils are primarily Alford soils, and those soils dry out fairly quick in the spring. They're not like sand, but they dry out quickly. It's a silt loam soil, and it's a um, very forgiving soil. It's one that, you know, if you go out and mistreat clay, you're gonna pay for that for two or three years, maybe a lifetime. But the silt loam, you can somewhat mystery. Um, <clears throat> After that August day, I went home and I basically ran the elevator. I weighed trucks in and weighed trucks out. We purchased a commercial grain elevator in 2005. So I got to meet with customers. I got to see people on a regular basis. So I was full of this new passion of soil, of, of soil quality at that time is what they talked about. So I got on the internet, I spent all fall, August, September, October, and November, on the internet, learning whatever anyone had to say. To the point that well, my customers were tired of crossing paths with me, my brothers were tired of hearing of me, because I was kind of create a change in our operation. Fortunately, the Lord blessed us, and we got done early harvest that year. Typically, our, our harvest runs from the first week of September till hopefully we get done before Thanksgiving. But this year, we got done in November. So the first thing we did is we went out and seeded about 600 acres of cover crops, which was just wheat cleanings. And we run a weasel over that and, and weasel that into the soil. And it came up and was a beautiful stand. Well, after we got that done, we went down to our local seed dealer with a fertilizer spreader and said, fill her up. And we headed to the field and we spread 
two loads of those completely full. We ended up with about 1,200 acres of cover crops the very first year. And what happened was, over that winter, with a heavy rain would occur, my oldest brother looked at that and said, we've got to change. The water coming off these fields is clearer. It's clearer than our other fields. It took my next youngest brother, my young brother younger than me, he partially changed by 2013, and by 2014, he totally changed. And he ran our three sprayer. He ran our termination of our cover crops, and he sprayed all of our ground. And uh, they, he was the uh, manager for running three sprayers over those acres. My youngest brother felt mis mistreated uh, or betrayed because he applied our anhydrous. And we took that away from him. We ended that. Uh, the reason we ended it me, was we was just, we, in, where we're at located, we can only put anhydrous on in spring. So we have to do that pre-planned. And with two big four-wheel drives, two 60-foot toolbars, two 1,500-gallon tanks behind that toolbar, we was doing nothing but destroying our soil. Because we was out there too early, we wasn't patient enough to wait. So anhydrous wasn't a problem. It was our management style was the problem. So we had to quit. And, and we wasn't smart enough to figure that out. We had to have a 2012. We had to have the worst drought in my lifetime for us to figure that out. And what we seen was a rolling corner syndrome. As you drove down the road, your fields waved at you. And what we had, and we've been tracking this for like three years, trying to figure out what our problem was. And what it was, as we did less and less tillage, moving to, towards no-till, we were getting injury from that anhydrous knife zone. It was injuring our roots. So we went from good roots to injured roots. Good roots to injured roots. And if you drove fast enough, it looked like the field was waving. On 2012, we no longer had injury. We went from good corn to death. Good corn to death. All across our grand farm. Whole farm. 2013, we sold all of our anhydrous equipment. We had 30,000 gallons of storage. <coughs> We had about 20 tanks, two 60-foot uh, toolbars. In the process, we sold four four-wheel drives and all of our tillage equipment. So in 2013, it was 100% no-till. The way you make a change is you got to sell it, you, or else you'll be tempted. <laughs> you'll be tempted to go use it. To the point, three years ago, we had a a lot of uh, ephemeral gullies and my guys went and bought a used field cultivator. You know what the problem with that was? The only guy we could find to run that was 72 years old. And he would not do just the ephemeral gullies. We couldn't get him to stop. We couldn't get him. We put, and it was our mistake. It wasn't his. Because he grew up that way till in the fields. So, I was mad at him from day one for buying it, but I kind of turned over the management of the operation over to the next generation because I wanted them to experience this. And it was time. They was in their 40s, and it was time for them to step up and do it. This particular picture is uh, cover crops of oats that uh, terminated over the winter. Uh, we, we were, when we first started down this new path of quitting tillage, uh, we had uh, Mike Plummer as a mentor, provided to us by the um, Farm Journal and uh, the Buffett Foundation. 
And he said to start out with something easy. And the easiest thing to start out with is spring oats. Spring oats will terminate. You can also put radishes in that. They will terminate. And that was where we started. And we did that for about four or five years. In 2013, 2014, we started uh, doing a lot of annual ryegrass. We prefer annual ryegrass. Uh, we're probably 60% uh, annual ryegrass. Out of the 20,000 acres, we do about 12, 10, 12,000 acres of cover crops. About 5,000 of our acres are river bottoms. And so we, we're not, uh, we don't have the guts yet to try the river bottoms because all I can see is these cover crops catching all the silt and the trash and how are we going to plant through that. We currently plant through all that trash with row cleaners. Row cleaners throws it out of the way and we just plant through it. And we typically plant our river bottoms about one week after the river gets back in the banks. So this past year we was done planting the first of June with all of our crops and then we started replanting floods and we finally finished up in the uh, first part of July. I want to talk a little bit, I don't know, maybe I need to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, my farming methods in uh, pre-2021 or 2011 was if uh, we run 32 row corn planters is what we like to use. We ran three of those. We also ran two soybean planters that were 20 inch row. And they had, the only thing they had on them was a uh, no-till coulter and uh, a different set of uh, closing wheels. We preferred cast iron wheels, but over time we've went to uh, the Vero Cruiser wheel. Our corn planter would have row cleaners, no, uh, and then just the double disc openers with the Vero Cruiser row, uh, row closers. We also put on, we variable rate our starting fertilize. We did a lot of on-farm testing. Um, we do that so we can figure out what's the best thing to do. Um, one of the things we, we learned early on in our testing was that uh, we needed to apply 200 pounds of urea pre-plant to our terminated cover crops. That was our best yielding and most profitable area. We felt like it was too much, but uh, when you're going from a full tillage situation to no-till and to cover crops, a lot of that gets tied, tied up in the system. So you still need to put in a uh, nitrogen one. And after we sold all of our equipment, uh, we wanted to put that nitrogen on front also because we didn't feel like we could side dress 10,000 acres and get it done. Because we was basically going from pre-plant to side dressing and we just didn't feel comfortable in trying to side dress that many acres. So we, that's another reason we spread that amount of urea. It kind of, and, and what we found out is you need to be putting nitrogen on about two, three times. So we was putting it on pre with the start, starter with the planter and then when we were side dressing. And then we use these data management programs to tell us if we got enough. <coughs> In that, it, these data management programs like Granular or um, Incirca with Pioneer, they'll tell you, they'll give you a heads up if you got a, if you're running short based off the weather. And once that we, we get that heads up, we go out and walk those fields, and then we would determine if we need a a uh, fourth application of nitrogen. Overall, since we started farming this way, we've reduced our nitrogen about 35 to 40 pounds per acre. Um, <clears throat> our typical fertilized program is if you take a high, medium, and low on a fertility test, we're typically in the low. We've never been in a operation that fertilized to the full 
full extent. Nitrogen, yeah, at one time we used to put on all we could, all we could put that we felt comfortable to, or comfortable. We used to put 225 pounds of nitrogen on all the time. Today we're down around 160, 150, 170. It depends. We, we categorize our farms into low, low productivity, medium, and high. The high usually gets about 180, and everything else is stretched down below that. And, and we've come to that through a lot of testing and nitrogen trials on the farm. One of the biggest things that, that I personally think has helped our soils become more healthy is in including turkey litter. We started out with a couple hundred a ton of turkey litter, and now we're up to about 12,000 tons a year that we spread. And to the point that uh, we have people calling us every week wanting us to take their turkey litter. Because with this depressed economy that ag's going through, nobody wants to take it. And, and because we farm in such a wide area, we're located in areas that we can take it and spread it with that. Uh, uh, we can spread it close to that source. And so that gives us a great opportunity to fit in with all these particular producers of turkey litter. I want to talk about things that I wish I'd never done in my life. Uh, the biggest thing is tillage. Um, since we quit tillage, every year that I go back and look, it's amazing how much we were destroying our soil structure, our fragile, our fragile soils, how much we was destroying that I literally get mad at our guys when they do any kind of tillage anymore. Um, whether it's to repair a ephemeral gully or to smooth out where they just lay tile. One of the uh, farms that we've farmed, and I'm going to talk about a couple, two or three fields. One of the fields is between two huge ditches. is a creek bottom and it's uh, zip soil and king soil some of the most lowest productive soil that we farm. Um, that particular soil is very high in clay. If, if you would mow board it, plow it, back in the old day, as you would go across the end rows, the, the bottoms would trip. I mean, it was just that type of clay. It was just tight as could be would trip. Our APH, and we farmed this farm since 1974. We finally quit putting corn on this farm because our APH was 68 bushel on corn. We, we planted soybeans for 14 years. During that 14 years, we quit tillage on that particular farm. It was one of the first farms we quit, we quit tillage on. And it was also the very, very last farm we planted every, every year. So we quit tillage, we started no-tilling the crop, and the reason we could no-till it if we killed it, it would take about a day or two to get it dry enough to work it two or three times. You'd have to call a packet, call a mulch. It was just a, a nightmare. Well, we found out we could run across it to plant it and, and get it planted a week, two weeks earlier. Yeah, you would leave a little track or something, but you got it out there and it would come it become a very positive thing just to get a plant because it was always our last. Now that farm's been tiled when we've got cover crops on it. And the last couple of crops have been over 150 bushel corn. And the soybeans are continuing to yield more and more all the time. That's the one farm I wanted to talk about. The other farm is a field that we started in my lifetime. We took the fences out of it and, and we started farming that pasture ground. That's organic matter was about 3.5, 3.7. On that same farm, 
located over the hill in the flat that had always been worked and farmed. It was with 25 acres that was really good soil. It's a, it's organic matter was 1.7. You know, we'll, we'll never get that back in three lifetimes. I mean, that's just, it just makes me sick. The other thing I want to talk about is a person that, another farm that we currently farm, and primarily we custom farm it for him. One of the first thing he did was hire us to tile his farm. The previous installed tile that he put in did not work. This was a creek bottom between some major ditches. This creek bottom was very productive. This particular producer, producer was a livestock, a hog farmer. He always spread the manure on the ground and disc it and disc it. If that didn't work, he disc it two more times. You know, he just disc it. We go down there and he hires us to pattern, pattern tile above his original tile. And that fall, they fly on annual ryegrass. The only place the tile worked was where he st uh, streaked the annual ryegrass. Only the tile under where the annual ryegrass was streaked did the tile work. That next year, he, he was our best cover crop seeder. He ran a a 36 foot drill typically each day he would call us up and say well I need fuel this is when I need fuel this is when I need seed three years in a row he drilled 6,000 acres in the fall this guy was amazing so he drilled his own farm that February the following February he called me he said Mark you aren't you're not gonna believe this all my tile work what you put in, plus my old tile, is all working. He said, and I figured out how much this annual ryegrass is growing in roots, and it's just amazing. He said, it's like 60 miles of roots for every seed. And he says, it's down there, opening up the soil so my farm can drain. The next year, the last, Three years on that farm, we've averaged over 200 bushels of corn. And two of those three years, it's been under three foot of water. That farm is amazing. The last thing I want to talk about, or farm I want to talk about, we got an opportunity in 2000 to move, out, move up to Robinson, Illinois, which is about two hours in a tractor. It's a northwest to level soil, level black soil. The only problem with this soil is it's got a clay pan about 12, 14 inches, similar to what uh, Terry Taylor has and uh, Mike Plummer had in southern Illinois. In that particular area, it's 12 to 14 inches thick. So what we didn't understand when we first moved up there is everybody did tillage. Everybody had track tractors. Everybody over tilled it to dust. We go up there and he tells us, he said, or the, this particular landowner tells us, he says, don't come up here until the third week of May. We always got up there before the third week of May. And the reason was, is because we were no-tilling and we got all everything else planted. So we'd go up there and plant, and we'd get an inch of rain, and that corn would literally drown out. I never seen any. I never seen any soil like this. This was something new that we run up against. Finally, we learned to wait to the third week of May to plant. And the reason you have to wait is the temperatures. The environment has to be warm enough for that moisture to evaporate up, because it's not going to go down. So you've got to wait till that temperature is warm. Third week of May, you're probably better off waiting to the fourth week of May. This year we still had to replant a little bit, but they averaged over 200 bushel this year. And the seed corn dealer finally come to us up there. He said, you guys have been the top 
for 10 years. I said you'd fail. Everybody said you'd fail. Because you can't farm these soils like this. You had the best looking crops by far of everybody up here this year. He says, there's something to what you guys are doing. So that makes me feel proud. It's hard. You, you have to have a lot of faith. You have to have a lot of trust. You have to have a lot of belief in Mother Nature. And if you have that in Mother Nature, you have it in the Lord. So, because everybody around you doesn't want you to do that. They want you to continue on serving human nature. Our human nature is, is that we know better than the next guy. And what we're doing is the right way. In reality, Mother Nature is the one that knows. We just got to figure out how to copy her and learn what she does right. And based off that, we have changed our operation to a very successful, profitable operation. I want to close or wrap this up. Um, and before I do, I just realized I got another two other things here that I need to talk about. One of the worst fields we farm is in Gibson County. It's a 40-acre track that has been strip mined. It's been put back. It's got uh, over 5% slopes on it. Very high unroadable. The soil is not, uh, it's just terrible. We started farming this farm in 2008. We have uh, six years of corn production. We have six years of soybean production. Our overall average is just 128 on corn. And our beans is 46. Now, if I throw out 2012, the yield of 16 bushel, which I did, that's how I come up with the 128 bushel average. I had to throw the 16 out. And if I take the last year, the last year we produced corn on that, we have a 22% increase in yield. If I take the last two years versus the first four years or three years, we have a 12% increase in yield. Now let's switch to beans. We currently have a 46 bushel average on that. If I take it the last year versus the three or five previous years, we have a 41% increase in bean yield. If I take the average of the last two years, we have a 21 and a half percent increase. We're nine years into this, and each year now, we are, we have invested and been patient. Um, soil health is a long-term <coughs> investment and a long-term commitment, but you will get paid off. We are being paid back with higher yields. I don't get to see all the yields anymore since I recently retired through a succession plan that turns it over to my three brothers and their sons. I did not have a son, so I was kind of on the odd man out, so I retired. And I asked them, I said, how are the bean yields this year? And they said, they're record again. The record for the third year in a row. And I asked them about the farm that laid next to this farm. I, talked to my son-in-law, he still works well. And he said, he even had the owner rode with him in the combine. He said, this, this farm is not capable of these yields. The monitor was going over 100 bushel soybeans. And, the, and it's a very, it's a 10% sloping farm, 5 to 10%, and very poor quality ground. He said, I don't know what you guys are doing, but you figured out something, you made it work. I want to say that my talk is called Healthy Soils, Healthy Water, Healthy Life. And if, if our soils eventually become healthy, and that's going to take probably 30 years. If you look at the uh, Chesapeake Bay Watershed Project, 
It's taken 25 to 30 years for the waters feeding into Chesapeake Bay to clear up. They were loaded with sediment and nutrients, and they started clearing up about two to three years ago. So that's a long term. We've got to start changing now so that our future will be able to have clean water. I know, I know what problems we have with running into Lake Superior, is it? Lake Erie. We got to start now so that we can clear that up in our next generation. And the big, you know, tillage is number one, cover crops is number two. And, and we just got to change. So once we get that healthy soil, the water becomes healthy. But in all this change, the thing that happened to me personally is my life become less stressful. The reason it becomes less stressful is our soil become more resilient. And as your soil becomes resilient, you can drive by these fields and not stress out about them because of this mycorrhizal fungi is helping feed the roots of these plants. If there's a shortage out there, that fungi helps supply that shortage. You know the old barrel that everybody talk about, the minimum effect law? <coughs> I'm trying to let me look here, see what it's technically called. I wanted to put that in this talk, but I didn't. The law of minimum, Langberg's law. You know, <coughs> this applies to a field that is in tillage. There's always something limited out there. But once you get a healthy soil, it's going to take care of itself. This law's not going to apply anymore. Because your mycorrhizal network and the soil livestock and the mother nature will take care of all your shortages. So that law's going to fail in the future. They call him the uh, father of fertilizer. So over time, but I'm talking 30, 35 years away. So that's all I have to say. I hope uh, you've enjoyed my talk. It's a little stressful for me to talk in front of large crowds. I like to talk personally in small groups. But I want to thank you again for this opportunity to come over here and talk. several questions from you folks out here so what do you want to ask Mark yes with the diversity of soils that you're farming did your uh, planter setups and your drill setups change as you work from the the lighter Alfred soils to the soils and everything in between well yes they did and and, and it as we went through this change, we went from a lot of manual settings and, and we become more technically, technology uh, current. And most of those adjustments are being done on the go now. And typically we have one guy that lets the other ones know what needs to be adjusted and they can adjust everything from the tractor cab. Uh, we have planted green one time and it was successful, but we never want to do it again. We like to terminate all of our crops uh, the last of March through April and then uh, plan into a terminated crop. You know, I figure we still have another six, seven years before our guys are ready to start planting green. And it, it's just a natural process. We can't be, <clears throat> we, we've got to figure out how, how to move down this path, this new path that we're on. You you can't jump to where I'm at. You gotta start and you gotta you gotta reorganize your whole farm and your whole thinking into how am I gonna be a healthy soil conservation system. It's a system. It's just not one thing. It's a whole complete system. What yeah. power crops is he used? Well, what cover crops are you using? We typically um, use a, a group of uh, cover crops. 
and, and I like to break it down into three different wood pains within a window. You have your early pain, your medium pain, and your late pain. The early pain, uh, we, we usually start with uh, some radishes. Uh, <coughs> we put in there spring oats. We also put in triticale. Um, we've also used uh, some spring barley and we've used some black oats. Then our middle pain is mainly our cereals. It's mainly triticale and barley. And uh, in the first pain, we also use a lot of crimson clover. Um, we've tried uh, winter peas with a planter. That was successful, but our guys decided they didn't want to wear out our planters. So we, we backed away from that. Uh, our last pain, <coughs> pain of window is for cereal rye. We start cereal rye in the middle pain, but typically in November, we're 100% cereal rye. Cereal rye will grow four inches a day in our area. Uh, <clears throat> by the first of April, it'll be, uh, or by the last of April, it'll be waist high. And um, we're just not ready to tackle that high, massive um, amount of residue. And, and we're, I mean, because we're running typically six planters each day, and the number well, we typically run between 1,200 and 1,500 acres planted daily. And we just, we already got enough problems just getting to the field. We just don't want to create more problems when we get there. So we, that's why we like to terminate. I think eventually we'll get there. Yes, I was taken back by that mean sounding pan you had in that black soil two hours away. What did you change and how long did it take to break through that sucker? Because corn go down to one like that and the roots will turn 90 degrees if you don't change that. The question is, uh, in Robinson, Illinois, two hours away, how did we get through that clay pan? We're still working on it. Uh, I think it took uh, Mike Plummer like 10, 15 years to break through it. I, uh, <clears throat> I think our guy's in the process of buying that farm, actually. Yeah, you're yielding, what, 200 bushel? Yeah, I don't, under I don't understand it. You know, we, we get 180 bushel on, on our, that's our average for offered soil. And we go up there, and we, we end up replanting that almost every year because we are not patient enough. But we end up with 200 bushel corn. Now this year, it was 200 bushel corn, but it was 22% when we harvested. So we had to haul it all back and dry it at our elevator. <clears throat> Typically, we haul. We sell to local elevators wherever we're at. Um, we did tile some of the lowest of that. Typically, when we tile a field, <clears throat> we put in the main, immediately come back and start putting in the laterals. We had to wait two weeks for the water table to lower before we could be put in any laterals. That thing shot water 10 feet up in the air after we got the main going in. That ground is so saturated with water, it's just out of this world. And I'm afraid what we put in, it might close back up. So we've got, and I can't get my guys to do annual ryegrass up there. But one of the neighbors that we farm up there, one of the larger neighbors that we farm by up there, their name is Shooty. They have stopped me at the last two national no-till conferences and have had long discussions with me about no-till. The third year we went up to that particular ground we go up there <coughs> to harvest in the fall. It was a very wet fall. And we drive across the fields and harvest it and leave a small track where we run our trucks multiple times. We have a small track, too, a bigger track, but we don't get hung up. These other guys are up here. Tracks on their auger carts, tracks on their combines, and pulling their trucks out of the fields. I mean, I've never seen such a sloppy mess. I guess if you had a desire to watch mud wrestling, you, that was what I thought it was. I mean, it was just disgusting. <clears throat> so, 
We did get hung up there last year. And I finally asked my guys, I said, what happened? Why didn't we get hung up? Well, they hit an old oil well pit. And he said, we just uh, went across that oil well pit and our green card just sunk. But the neighbors thought we were out there having fun, but that's not really what happened. But these shookies are switching to no-till. They're starting to quit tillage. You know, one of the discussions we had last night is how does people change? And I think the biggest way they change is watching the neighbor, who may be the biggest farmer, he may not be the smartest farmer, but he's the biggest farmer, and, and he has the most iron, and he's blowing the most smoke, and he's covering the most acres. And I think that's a human trait that we watch these things. I'm not saying it's always right, that's just what it was. I admit today that we were addicted to green paint, diesel smoke, and large large equipment. I mean, we were, and tillage, we was addicted to it. Because we thought we could cure every problem we had with more tillage. Where in fact, that's the farthest thing from correct. Tillage is, the worst thing you can do. <clears throat> so, farming that many acres, how supportive was your landlords or non-supportive of your venture into not no-till and cover crops? Most our landlords uh, rent to us because they look at us as four brothers farming. At the time, it was four brothers farming together. And they trusted us. They had a lot of faith in what we did. And plus, when you write these people a cash rent check, it's better to deal with four people than it is one. Because if one doesn't make it, the other four, the other three will pay. Now, <clears throat> in that, we had two landlords that just threw all kinds of, I don't know what the proper word is, fits, uh, to the point that we went over to plant their fields and we, they wouldn't let us plant them. They literally wanted us to work the fields. And we said, we won't work the fields. We, and they said, well, what about those ditches? Other people don't have those ditches. Our theory for many years has been on ephemeral gullies. Every time you work on the next big rain, it's just in a ditch. So if we can cross them, we cross them. We slow down and cross them and let them go. Um, eventually, we got to do some kind of conservation practice. And, and the reason we had to do that correction is Eventually, you can't cross them, and you tear up equipment, lots of equipment. So uh, we went and tilled in those ephemeral gullies and planted it. And after two years, he just he just lets us go on. And then we have other another one that didn't want us to do it, but we convinced him otherwise to do it. So. Um, I'm trying to develop a, uh, I'm now managing some of this ground and renting it to my brothers. I'm trying to come up with a flex lease that the landowner can participate in this soil health. As we go down this road, we're starting to see these yields move up and they need to be able to participate in that. Instead of us carrying the whole risk, they need to end the risk and reward. They need part of the reward too, so that we can move on and move more. Because I can imagine what they will say when we start planting green. Yes. So the younger generation that you've gone to, are they, are they excited? Is the younger generation excited? I have. <clears throat> there's uh, four of them. Um, three of them are all all in and the other one is was my uh, youngest brother's son and he was opposed to he now 
he shows up at Junior Upton's field day this last spring, and he says, you know, this is what we need to be doing. Well, I haven't seen him do it yet, but at least he's thinking about doing it. That's, that's where it's at. And, and I, I talk to him a lot. We own about 3,400 acres. Uh, we rent all the rest of it, and all but four or five landowners are uh, cash rent. The four or five is, there's a couple 60-40s, a couple 50-50s, but everything's pretty well with the cash rent. It, we've had people come to us from four counties away because we were a family organization working together. And they just accepted when we went to cover crops and no-till, and they just accepted that. And, and I'm thankful. And I'm thankful, I'm actually blessed that the next generation, when I started down this path, come to me and said, we gotta figure this out. This is the way we need to be going. And, and the biggest benefit, the less stress, it is. A lot less stress today than when we was before, when we was doing this full tillage. How do you get your fields when you tie a few tile back in shape? Um, how did we get our fields back in shape after we tile? Um, sometimes we do a good job. Sometimes we do a terrible job. Um, it depends on how the tile goes in, to be honest. Uh, if it goes in right, it's usually just a matter of running a small, we have a, I don't even know what they call it. It goes behind and it throws it back in and it kind of runs the disc over it. We bought it to uh, close uh, irrigation tracks and you follow the irrigation track around and it throws that dirt back in there. And it works pretty good. But if you're not patient, you'll see a guy out there with a disc or a field call waiter, and then it's kind of screwed up. You, you need to run this um, irrigation track thing over about twice, and then it, it's pretty good. But it takes patience. And you I, said uh, you had your eye-opening experience at a field day, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what you say to a neighbor or another grower on the fence, they're not sure they're ready to do this. What would you say to them? I um, would say that you got to start small. You got to start with what you own, the farm ground that you own. You don't want to start on the, rent, the ground that's rented. There's too much risk that the neighbor will be farming it next year. I know David's had that problem. Um, <clears throat> And you start out with the easiest crops that you feel like you can manage. And then you just keep moving up the ladder. You just keep moving up the ladder. I mean, we started out with crimson clover and spring oats. And we planted in the crimson clover. And it was already blooming the last week of April. Um, we planted it the 1st of May. And it was already in seed. It was dead. We didn't have to terminate. Yes. When you follow up to that, when you do start to do a program, how concerned did you get in the early days about sharpening your pencil, looking at the budgets? David Brand has talked about that so many times. You must have had a similar experience. So that what you did to change was going to return to you the money. Well, we felt like the reduction in capital costs, you know, to, uh, getting rid of four-wheel four drives and uh, getting rid of all the tillage equipment. And the problem had gotten to the point, the only reason we did less tillage is because we couldn't find uh, suitable employees to do that tillage with, with equipment 
without tearing it up. See, the problem when I grew up, I didn't have enough horsepower to tear anything up. And even though I wasn't smart, you know, I just wasn't maybe smart enough to operate it correctly. I just didn't have enough horsepower to tear it up. Today, these tractors are five, six hundred horsepower. You can tear up a hundred thousand dollar tillage tool in one round with those type of tractors. They're just unforgiving. And finding the people that know how to properly operate that has went to nil. So it was kind of a natural progression for us to get out because we couldn't find the people to do tillage. That's an interesting comment. You couldn't find enough people to do how to do tillage anymore. It, uh, you can't find good employees. No. Not enough good employees. And, and with them high horsepower tractors, you're tearing up major tear. They're made unbelievable how much something up. Driving down the road and hitting a bridge. Or turning in a field. And, and leaving it down. Those, those four-wheel drives will make the turn. And <laughs> it won't be back there by the time you straighten out. <laughs> and they're gone. <laughs> nutrient density, we've not looked into that. Um, one of the things that we did about 2005 is we started a corn flour plant. We was making masa and selling it to the uh, taco people. And we were making, uh, and at that particular time, we was uh, not GMO corn, yellow and white, that was making these tortillas. And, uh, You know, we tested that for color and stuff of nutrients either. But we was able to ship overseas and ship everywhere. But we eventually switched to GMO crops because nobody cared at that time. Now that industry's changed and I'm sure that it wasn't on GMO again. But uh, we sold that to Bunker after about 10 years because it needed to expand. We was running seven days a week, uh, 24 hours a day, making tortillas, flour, cold boss. Uh, none of us was willing to expand the plant after going through and almost being broke. So we, we, just, we just didn't have any gumption anymore to take it on again. Question I was wondering about with all the rented land, I'm sure many are interested in this. What kind of long range agreement do you have with the landowners so that when you're investing, you know you're going to get five or ten years to get that back? A very good question, Randall. It's one, probably one of the things I should have had in my written speech to cover. We have changed all of our rental agreements to August. Uh, we no longer like December 1, we, need, we don't like February. We want to know August 1st if we're farming that farm next year so that we can put cover crops on it. So, you know, as an industry, we've got to change all of our landowners and all the farmers to a different time period of um, doing next year's cash rents agreements. They need to be moved to either the 1st of August or the end of August because Within a few weeks, you're going to be doing cover crops, and you don't want to put that investment out there if you're not going to do it. Now, typically, three-year contracts. A few people we do 10-year contracts with. Um, 
If we do any longer than three year contracts in the state of Indiana, we have to file them at the courthouse. They have to be filed to be legal. Uh, they're not a legal contract if they're over three years. To be, they're not enforceable. So, uh, I, you know, <clears throat> And, and the only reason we have 10-year contracts is those people wanted some extra money, so we paid them extra money up front. And to get them out of hawk, we had to go 10 years to get it done. <laughs> so that's, and still they could live and survive. So the only long-term ones are really not done to farm the farm for 10 years. It's done because the landowner needed some funds to fix whatever or do whatever, and we provided that, and then in that, we spent the time and the money and the effort to do a long-term contract. Typically, we are three-year contracts. And we usually add in, which is probably not legal, a uh, automatic renew clause. But <clears throat> you could probably fight that and lose pretty easy, but that's what we put in there. Um, close to our home base, we have very little turnover. Uh, the further out you get, we have some uh, turnover, and it's not because of our farming style or somebody else coming in farming. It's because of uh, death, people passing on, next generation selling the farm. Um, I'm trying to think one. In, all, in, in my time of farming, I can only think of five farms that we've lost because somebody else wanted it or rented it and paid more money. We, we've never had that problem. So, you know, we always just went ahead and put the cover crops on them. If we lost it, it usually wasn't a significant farm. I think we're going to be there on time, but Mark's going to be on the panel again here in a little bit. But one thing I want you to stop and think about and consider, when he's talking, this happened in our own operation, but when you stop and think about the amount of physical hardware that it takes to work that much ground ahead of six planters, and how much manpower it takes, and those tractors he's talking about are six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars a piece, and pulling a hundred thousand dollar tillage tool, and he got rid of four of them. There's several million dollars that went down the road there. And look at the amount of diesel. You know, when I first switched to no till, my fuel supplier called one know if I was mad and switched to somebody else. You know, that's just the physical cost involved is astronomical. And the depreciation is, and that's a real cost. The, the fuel thing, we used to use the most fuel in the spring because we was doing anhydrous, we was working the ground two and three times. Now we hardly use fuel in the spring. We typically can plant an acre of a crop for three-tenths per acre. And that's, that's unheard of. Now in the fall, when you get behind these combines with 16 row corn heads and 12 row corn heads, and the way you shell more is you turn up the horsepower. So then uh, we use a tanker load a week in the harvest. No, our largest fuel we use here anymore is trucks. Our trucks use more fuel than all the rest of the, the whole operation of the trucks use the fuel. So, you know, it's just been an amazing transition here for someone who was all that heavy tillage. And like he said, the way to get out of that temptation is to sell it. Get it out. And then I've had to do the same thing and turn around and buy some of those pieces back that you got rid of. But, so I think what we want to do now is have a few minutes of a break. Get the bio break, bathroom break here, get a stretch. We want to be back ready to go at 11.15, right? Okay, we're running a pretty tight schedule today, so if you try to adhere to that, we appreciate it. So thanks for your attention so far. <laughs>